Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this episode of the Matt Finance Show. This is part. This is one of our mini series um, where we interview the winners of the of the Matt Finance Awards. Um, today, we're joined by the winners of Finance Team Matt Finance Team of the Year, um, and they are from Boudica. And rather than get the introduction wrong, um, could one of you introduce the trust um, and also introduce yourselves, please? Right, OK, I'm Jen, Head of Finance. Um, I'm, I have got background in NHS and qualified through the Regional Finance Training Scheme um, quite some time ago, but I've got general um, public sector awareness as well. I was Charlie. Yeah, I'm Charlie Atkins. I'm the Management Accountant. I've recently um, become part qualified um, with ACCA and I'm working towards um, full qualification. Hi, I'm Phil Beecher. I'm the Trust's Chief Operating Officer and uh, CFO. Um, so like Jen, I spent some time in uh, the NHS and before that uh, I qualified at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, as for the Trust itself, uh, we're 11 school mat uh, based uh, in North, uh, North, North, East Norfolk and Norwich. We've got two uh, large secondary schools, two specialists and then seven primaries. So it's a bit of everything from nursery all the way to uh, sick form and everything in between. Fantastic. Thank you. What I do first of all is just read out the judges comments that talk around um, yeah, the reasons why why you won the award. Um, so the finance team at Boudicca Schools Trust were nominated for this award for their individual and collective outstanding contribution and dedication to the trust, schools and the wider sector, which goes above and beyond what would be expected. Outstanding features of this entry include a saving of £85,000 over three years by reviewing math software provision across all of the trust primary schools, helping another local trust implement their new finance system by sharing their knowledge and experience experience of setting the system up and leading the way nationally on implementing e-invoicing. Also of note was being amongst the first to make use of the automatic uploads on the AAR and a report from consultants specialising in procurement who were unable to identify any savings across a number of areas of non-pay, highlighting the diligence with which the finance team have consistently achieved the best value for money. That was awkward, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, what, what a pack of what a terrible pack of lies. <laughs> no, I mean it was pretty clear from your from your entry that there was such a mixture of successes, and the the thing that really stood out was how that was shared across the team. Um, and you know, obviously, as a as a team of the year award, that was obviously an important factor. Could you could you kind of outline the team structure that you have at the trust and kind of the responsibilities, just in terms of roles and responsibilities? OK, I can do some of that. Um, we basically got a centralised team. Um, we generally work from one large office, um, so there are about seven or eight of us. We all interact on a regular basis, um, informally as well as um, semi-formally. So every week we do have a, a weekly sort of get together to, to thrash through any particular themes or, or developments and things like that so everyone is aware. Um, we interact with the schools well as well. Um, we've got a purchase ledger clerk who takes on all of the data processing, which leaves the others who a lot of them are studying, leaves them to be able to analyse the, the data, get some information out of it and start working on reporting and, and speaking to the, the heads and the budget holders. To, to take things forwards. So it, it, it t tends to work on specialisms rather than doing a bit of everything. OK, that makes sense. And how does that, What? where does the line draw in terms of the financial responsibilities in the schools? What part in the financial process do the schools play? And then what's done as part of the central provision? I mean, I, I can cover that one. So as Jen said, it's, it's pretty centralised in terms of um, how the organisation runs. Um, so financial responsibility obviously the head is ultimately the budget holder for their school for all the educational related expenditure but the estate's budget is set centrally so are utilities because we wouldn't expect a head to work out how much they need to budget for energy especially especially today at the moment um so at schools it's largely sort of like ordering receipting of goods but as Jen said, we've got you know a really high skilled, dedicated finance team centrally who will do prepayments, journals, all the monthly management accounts, and it very much functions on a a business partnering approach. So um, you know if we need to do it, look at you know 
you know, you've got an increasing role or decreasing role. That'll be, you know, one of the uh, assistant management accountants having a meeting with the head teacher, looking at how that would work with staffing, for budgets, um, and that sort of process. So it's, I suppose it's a, a partnering role. The heads can get as involved as they want. You know, we've got one head who, who he gets depreciation and everything like that. Another head who are sort of like literally just wants to like, you know, how can I get squeeze my budget for as much as possible? Which, you know. As one of the examples we gave there is, you know, saving £85,000 over three years of a math software. Um, that was something Ch Charlie did with a lot of the um, primary heads, sort of like quite a long time ago now, actually. Yeah, three years ago, I believe, yeah. So, so yeah. I've realised all that £85,000 saving now. Got to find some more, Charlie. <laughs> well, and that was that stood out as well, because it can be very difficult to lead a finance project um, as a more junior member of staff with head teachers stakeholders it's just a difficult it's a difficult concept um so how how did you firstly charlie kind of get empowered to do that um and then secondly how did you how did you deliver that program and you know corral a group of head teachers i'm sure your head teachers are excellent but corralling head teachers at the best of times as we all know can be a challenge um yeah how did you do that as a you know relatively new um apprentice I'd probably say when I was working at Martham, the head teacher came through and advised me that they um, had used the software in the past. And okay. from that point onwards, I went to Phil and Jen to ask them um, how to approach it and what skills and behaviours to implement, um, whereby they, they advised the process, finding out um, whether any other heads would like the software, um, you know, if they could offer a discount and um, the multi-year contract, wh whether that was available. And from that point onwards, I then contacted the supplier to find out um, what they could actually offer in terms of their service model and how different that looked in comparison to what the academies already had. And um, yeah, yeah, the rest was history really with, with that. Um, able to negotiate um, firstly a 10% saving and then followed on by a 5%. And that was secured for a total of three years. And that's brilliant. And it was clear that that the the the, the responsibility to implement pro programs was spread across the team. And Phil, is that a, is that a deliberate ploy in terms of increasing overall team capacity? If you can use everybody in the team to to drive and deliver their own projects, because I guess if everything was to fall at your door, that would limit capacity. Jen smiling, I don't know if it would limit anything but else. Nothing, but... <laughs> nothing would get done. <laughs> nothing would get precisely. And that do you feel it's then important to then spread that responsibility across the team and actually let people drive their own programmes? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think it's there's that, always that danger that when you've got, you know, um, you know, gra you know, young graduates, apprentices or recent school leavers in the finance team or, you know, HR or anywhere like that, there's almost this view that, oh well, they're really young, they haven't got any experience, so you know, they won't be able to do anything other than sort of like you know, data entry. And actually it's like, no, you've got really highly skilled, enthusiastic, intelligent, um, young professionals. So why not give them, you know, throw opportunities at them, give them some guidance and see what they do with them. So I think Charlie, you'd only been with us at like, what, 18 months? And you're like, yeah. what, 22 at that point? And yeah. it's, okay, let, you know, let's give people projects, see, uh, see what they can do with them. Um, and I suppose- the, the approach, Yeah, exactly. The approach we've had is that the more people when you're trying to drive improvement and change, the more people that are driving improvement and change, the more improvement and change you'll get. So why would you ever sort of like self-limit that to just um, managers? And, you know, um, I think Charlie, I mean, you had a conversation with like, what, five or six different primary heads yeah. as part of doing that. And it was putting the model forward that well, there's this piece of software that actually probably delivers the same sort of output. It's, you know, a fraction of the price. You know, there's the compelling case for change. And um, and I think if you're articulating that clearly and the value proposition to head teachers, it doesn't really matter how old or experienced you are. You're you know you're selling positive change. And yeah. I mean I think yeah, even sort of like people as soon as they come into a finance team as an apprentice, people get given sort of like you know quite challenging you know tasks and stuff like that with the support. But yeah, um, yeah they make rapid progress. And, and then they can cascade that down to other staff as well. So we, we try yeah. and give give everyone a sort of an element to be a specialist at uh, in a particular project. Um, and then they they develop whatever the project is and then train other staff members up. And that they're, they're sort of the first port of call for the queries. But we do try and sort of spread the load a bit so that everyone can get 
get a bit of meat on their on their job description and things like that. Yeah, so just just example, one apprentice, he'd been in here for sort of like was that here for about six months and he was yeah. basically he's given responsibility for getting Amazon sorted out, business account, full purchase ordering was integrated into the ledger. Most um recent apprentice um is basically looking at some of the um like purchase ordering and some of the other stuff. Carbon accounting. Being, yeah, exactly. So it's like just give people the opportunities and see what we can do with them rather than just assume oh well then you they won't be able to do anything how do you how do you recruit your apprentices i mean we as a business at, at imp we've we've worked really hard to to recruit apprentices and it i found it really difficult really difficult to identify because you've got a limited data set in terms of what you have to make a decision how what does your process look like because it looks like you've had some great success in terms of the apprentices you've you've managed to recruit we try and have a good advert for starters um advertise in the right places um this year the the recruitment wasn't as positive but the year before we had 57 applicants um and that was a lot of sifting out to see what, what we could do we very much go on attitude and conscientiousness and just general demeanor um Obviously, if someone has got relevant exams in an area, then that is a bonus point. But at this stage, I would say that personal traits are much more important than yeah. um, uh, proven abilities. Yeah. So if, if they haven't necessarily got an A level in, in maths or whatever we would ideally like, so long as they prove that they've got commitment, then um, we would take them further and put them out for a bit of a, a test. And, yeah, and just to say, we, we also advertise at our GCSE and A-level results days. So we always make sure whenever we're recruiting apprentices, and that's not just in finance, that's in HR, IT, you know, any of those sort of apprenticeship roles, we'll advertise at the results days for our secondaries and sixth form. And, um, you know, whenever there's a careers fair, we'll have a, a Boudicca Schools Trust stand because why would you not? And, you know, Charlie, you work in your old German classroom. Um, yeah. We've got, um, I think we've got three ex students from our two secondaries just in the central functions itself. Um, I don't count the head of HR because he he left school, he left Sprouton a little while ago. But um, but yeah, I think that is, um, and you, one of the things we're looking at is you know doing some stuff like how do we add value to the education side of things. So potentially doing stuff with um, A level business studies and stuff like that. And not that we'll go in and start poaching kids straight out of a class and uh, we've got an attendance problem because they're now in finance but it's that how do you how do you link and how does the mat as a wider organization add value to the classroom and i think that's something we're looking at this year hopefully once the shadow of covid lifts yeah no it's great how do you because i think you mentioned around um kind of conscientiousness and attitude do you t do you have tests is it interview techniques how do you decide because we th we look for the same thing. We try, and um, apologies if I'm using this purely to help us recruit. Um, but I know this is, uh, you know, kind of a fairly consistent thread across the sector. How do you pinpoint those softer bits around attitude and conscientiousness? Is that through intuition? A test? <laughs> intuition. I knew you were going to say that. Woman's, woman's <laughs> intuition basically is what Jen's saying. Okay, so we just need That's to borrow Jen. So we'll borrow Jen for her, her charge out rate is surprisingly high. That's all I'll say at this point. Um, now I think I think it's one of those things. It's um, it's trying to make the the interview more of a conversation. I think you always try and get that thing where people say, "Oh, you need to put people under pressure in an yeah. interview to see to get the best out of them." And I think our view is actually the role of a good interviewer is to create an environment where the candidate can give the best possible. Um, account of themselves otherwise you end up with a high pressure environment just a lot of confident extroverts and that's not really a great um diverse or inclusive mix in the team so i think it's having a couple of exercises so we have something that looks at time management sort of like an intro one with some excel um and it's not really the objective of oh how good or far you get on the excel exercise it's kind of one of the questions is well what would you do if you were doing that in real life and the answer we're looking for or i'd probably google it and try and find out how to do it myself or i'd ask a colleague that's that's what you're after rather than how far on the excel exercise someone gets is are they a bit of a self-starter are we going to use the initiative are we going to try and learn things for themselves rather than just be like oh i can't do it that's so i suppose it's getting those sort of questions teased out i mean you can always say oh would you describe yourself as conscientious and hope they say yes but you know um but yeah, yeah, those, that, really. 
Yeah, we yeah we seem to have, we seem to have sort of like hit on a bit of a magic formula because we've had a, a train of really really cracking apprentices, and that's that's really difficult to do. Um, and yeah, you can see the results, the, the achievements of the team. You can see that that's that's delivered by a breadth of expertise in the team and that culture of excellence. And I'm, that probably brings on to the next question around. You put one thing in your entry around how you found the time to support a local trust going through a finance implementation. It's something you've been through a couple of years earlier. That's no small undertaking. How do you find the time to do it? And is, is that do you feel it's quite important to to work within the sector and and help colleagues across the piece? Yes, yeah, so the yeah, last certainly. few years we've been trying to sort of streamline a lot of the work. So we've got a heavy automation now of a lot of processes, um, and it's kind of feed things into spreadsheets and the results come out the other end. Obviously, it needs more interpretation and written analysis, but the the work has been streamlined as much as possible, which then gives the free time. So Charlie has spent quite a lot of time with another trust looking at how they can implement um, the system. Charlie, do you want to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, so firstly, um, a, a couple of months ago, we were talking to a, a trust around moving on to the um, finance system from their current provider. And we we're talking about the um, the areas we had to go through to get to where we are now. And, um, you, you know, the, um, the the finance systems roadmap and um, talking about really um, what it looked like when we got the system versus now and the drivers we've implemented um, to get to where we are today. Yeah. And we, we talked through the features on the system and how it will benefit them um, as an educational trust and, and really that's that aspect of things. I think some of it was just like how to set up your chart of accounts, how yeah. to make use of the functionality, how, even sort of like when you're designing your authorization tree, don't do this and, and just talking them through um, because there's a difference when you've got the system provider talking to you about it versus people who actually use it on a day to day basis in another mat. And I think it was just sharing some of the the wrong paths we'd gone down initially in setting yeah. it up. We've then had to correct just to save them the time. And I mean, just to, just to answer the question directly in terms of where do we find the time? I think, you know, Jen's already talked to. We've got a lot of um, efficiency in the team now it was during summer so when it was quiet so there was sort of like the timing was part of the opportunity as well but yeah. i think our view is you know the, you know that conversation sort of like you know we've got stuff to learn from other people and we don't have monopoly on the best way of doing things but every time you're having an opportunity or conversation with someone you know you'll lose something as well so um and i think yeah probably there's probably not there's probably not a week goes by when we don't have another trust in central services, speaking yeah. to one of the areas, I think you did a presentation to another trust. Um, yeah. yeah. And yes, uh, go uh, Sorry, go on. Just on the back of Phil's comment around time, um, we, we feel that, you know, if it's important, we'll always find the time. And that is something we find very important, supporting the peers in the sector, because ultimately we're all trying to achieve the same goal in delivering um, the best possible education for um, the pupils in Norfolk and beyond. And that and it's clear that you've got a culture of continuous improvement. So I picked up a few things you were saying there. You know, even though you're giving your time to help, you're always in listening mode as well. So you're always trying to kind of soak up and, and understand what other good practice is happening um, mm -hmm. to see which bits of that you bring back. And I remember, uh, Phil, with this, you wanted to be introduced to everybody else that had entered to hear about all the good things they've been doing. To well, see maybe, not, maybe well. not everyone, but def definitely, not every, definitely, yeah. the winner, definitely the winners. Because I think there were, lo there were loads of people who entered into it. But um, yeah, we were keen to sort of like, yeah, get in touch with, you know, some of the other things, um, like some of the people who are highly commended and the winners in terms of, you know, we haven't got exclusivity on good ideas. So what have other people got that, you know, that's good that we haven't? And I think that's important. Every trust that, that, that we deal with have, have things they know are working better than others. And there's not a single trust out there that's like, we've completed map finance and it's just beat up time because it's working. It's just that continuous journey, which probably brings me on to my last question um, around DfE chart of accounts and AAR auto submission. I think you were involved in the very first pilot. Um, if you talk briefly around what that pilot looked like and then how that's going to work ongoing, and secondly, your views on DfE chart of accounts, because you've now embedded that for a couple of years now. Well, I mean, we weren't we weren't in the very initial pilot because that was our first year we had the finance system in, but we did do it um, this year, and I think there are only about four or five trusts in the country, so it's not um, 
it's not yeah. as popular as they might suggest it is. Um, I think it's a it's a useful exercise, certainly the bigger you are as a trust, um, and you know we're potentially merging and doubling in size in a couple of months, so the gains are really there to be had. Um, it is a bit of a um, a challenging process in terms of some of the mapping. We don't use the DFE chart of accounts because about four or five years ago we did a really big exercise to get them where we are, but we have mapped our accounts to the DFE chart of accounts, almost like nominal by nominal, and that's how it works. As for the DFE chart of accounts themselves, they're okay. I think it doesn't have the level of disaggregation we'd want on some areas uh, like supply. We have that analysed by vacancy, um, sickness, maternity, training, yeah. just to give us an understanding in terms of a bit more nuanced understanding of why, how and why we're spending agency. Um, and the DfE chart of accounts doesn't necessarily have, I mean, it's got, you know, a million different pension codes for um, your know, balance sheet assets and liabilities, which is wonderful. But um, for us, I think some of the, a bit of a more description on the, um, on the INE. But like I say, since ours is fully matched, we've decided not to go down that route at this point. But it, we can still use annual accounts return BFRs because we've got more mapped. Exactly. And that's a really important point. So we've got a lot of people that we're speaking to asking around, do we move to the chart of accounts? Is it going to be mandated? And the fact that you're doing an auto submission and the DFE chart of accounts is not your primary nominal code structure just shows there is no pressure to, to move your whole finance system restructure onto the DFE chart of accounts. If I was picking up a new finance system, would I do it? Probably, yeah, because I think that obviously there are those disaggregation pieces that you described, but if you're you going to make sure it's compatible. <clears throat> yeah. Um, there are plenty of systems yeah. out there still that are not going to be compatible. And I wouldn't do a big expensive reorganisation piece to change my coding structure when a mapping allows auto submission for our customers at IMP. It allows BFR, BFRO, not a separate thing at the moment, but um, a mapping is fine. You don't need to spend four, five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds is what I saw at one point to move that's just to change nominal code structures. Um, there's no need you can submit. So it's a bit of a I'm glad we come on to that because it's a bit of a bugbear in mind at the moment. Um, that I, I won't take any more of your time. That's been a really interesting discussion and thank you for joining us just to share some of the things around around what you've been doing. Um, congratulations once again on being the inaugural um, Map Finance Team of the Year. Um, I hope you've got your trophy um, and you should be very proud and Thanks again. In terms of finding you guys, you're on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, if people want to pick your brains on finance systems, obviously you don't want to uh, open the floodgates. But if people want to pick up any things you've talked about, how can they? How can they get in touch? Um, yeah, we're we're all on LinkedIn. Um, I mean, yeah, happy for you to sort of like certainly share my email address in, in the first instance. Will if people want to get in touch with you. Um, yep. And then on to us. Uh, to be fair, we, you know, I say regularly sort of like get messages on LinkedIn or sort of like emails or phone calls from uh, some of the Map Partnership Network events we've been to. So I mean, yeah, more than happy for people to um, to reach out to us. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations, one again, once again, um, and yeah, good luck over the next twelve months. Thank you. Okay, thank yes. you.